Hi, this is Kirby Summers for the Epstein Project podcast. Today, uh, I have a special uh, surprise for you. Uh, Professor Hamamoto uh, has been gracious enough to allow me to invite him on my show so that he can interview me on my podcast. And the reason that we're doing this is that we can then separately share this interview uh, with our respective audiences in order to expand its reach. And with that, I am going to um, say hello to Professor Hamamoto. Hello, Daryl, how are you today? How are you, Ms. Summers? Thank you very much for this invitation. This is going to be another incredible conversation with your ongoing research. And I have seen your two most recent videos. It's on your channel. It's Kurt yes. from, from my audience, Kirby Summers, S-O-M-M-E-R-S. You want to go there? You want to subscribe so you can get all the notifications. So I'm up to speed, I believe, uh, on your most recent finds on uh, one Ira Levin, and as you know, I've really been hot on his trail, and you have uncovered a treasure trove of information on him. So do you want to, and also you mentioned Absolutely. Chateau Marmont. Huh? What's <laughs> well, that? yeah, because it's all connected, but I do want to say, drop the Miss Summers, it's Kirby, everybody calls me Kirby, especially you. Okay, um, Kirby. <laughs> you're, you're like my, you're my new brother. It's like, you All know, right. we're just like joined at the hip at this point. Our audience is the same. Um, we have the same enthusiasm for outing the, uh, the things that people didn't think were part of this story, which does include um, sacrifice, satanic stuff, rituals. Um, so... And I extend the same courtesy to you. Please call me Daryl. Thank you, Daryl. <laughs> okay. um, I'm so happy you watched the last two um, videos that I dropped. And everyone, if you are not following Professor Hamamoto, which is how he pronounces for his show, uh, just do a quick uh, go to YouTube, pull up his name. He's got, I believe, three or four different channels. Subscribe to all of them. Subscribe to his Patreon. Uh, because his work is, it, it, I cannot tell you how impressed I am. I, I, I met him through one of our mutual uh, followers. Uh, we connected, this is the third show I do with um, him. And if you're not following him, you're missing out on a trailblazer. So um, with that, I, I just want to ask you, um, Daryl, if I could just explain to the audience that, you know, how I believe Hollywood is an arm of the intelligence services. And then from there kind of uh, show how I arrived to Ira Levin. Please. Okay. So um, I think that it's well known by now that mainstream media, which includes Hollywood, uh, is an arm of the intelligence service. Uh, they, they also do social engineering through films. And that's where people like Stanley Kubrick come in and Ira Levin and Roman Polanski. And uh, social engineering through films is the use of propaganda to sway the perceptions of uh, the citizens. Um, so pretty much uh, what happened was I was um, looking into the history of one of the victims of Jeffrey Epstein and Glenn Maxwell. And it led me to a, an actor in the UK uh, who, who's pretty much, he was 40 years, 45 years her senior. And so it was very clear to me that she, you know, within the Jeffrey Epstein and Glenn Maxwell uh, sex slave apparatus, that she had been introduced to him. Now, he apparently had a successful show in the UK, uh, but also um, there had been some rumors about him that were not really substantiated until he passed away, that he was supposed to have been at Sharon Tate's home in Los Angeles uh, on Cielo Drive on the night that Charles Manson murdered uh, 
an eight and a half month pregnant Sharon Tate, uh, who was the wife of Roman Polanski. And so that led me, you know, into Charles Manson, who obviously went to Boys Town, and I believe he too is an MK Ultra victim. And, and it's my contention that um, Roman Polanski, who was not really successful until he connected with um, Ira Levin, pretty much um, orchestrated the ritualistic satanic murder of his wife, his firstborn, eight and a half months now, um, and that this was uh, a prelude which was planned in the 1967 novel by Ira Levin called Rosemary's Baby. Um, Daryl, ha have you sort of reached the same conclusion? Absolutely, but not uh, to the degree that you have, because the, as you know, it's the biographical elements that allow the entire picture to better come into focus. And you've done, you've made great strides in there, because as you mentioned, and I know this because I tried, <laughs> there's not very much on Ira Levin on uh, the interweb, as some people <laughs> I call that the interweb, <laughs> just to be funny. Yeah. I, I mean, the bad guys reason. like humorous uh, fools like me. They tend to leave you alone if they think you're just a clown. So I call it the interweb. There's not there's nothing on there, but you found a lot. Yeah, I found a lot, and it took me back over a hundred years. Uh, and it all connects to Ira Levin's uh, books, and he leaves a lot of clues. And it's through these books that I was then able to connect him to. Um, things that are, again, connected to our government, our intelligence agencies, our founding fathers, um, and all of these um, sort of, you would think that skull and bones is just skull and bones, but they're all interconnected. And, and they, again, have um, long, it's a long reach back into the founding of the United States. Um, and, and before we're done with this conversation, people will understand what I mean. Right now I'm being a little bit vague, but um, okay. So then to, to get back to um, Charles Manson had a group of followers, which is very similar to Jeffrey Epstein's group of followers. Um, he had teenage kids. Um, he was going to a clinic that was where uh, some of the uh, CIA scientists were. Uh, I'm not going to name a lot of names because I don't want to set off any, uh, any odd things happening here with this conversation, but it was being... Um, uh, these clinics were free clinics in San Francisco during the time that um, the uh, culture movement was the hippie movement and the Beatles and all of these, the Rolling Stones and all of that was, was, was sort of pre-orchestrated. And so everyone kind of headed to uh, San Francisco and Charles Manson was going to a certain clinic, which is also connected to a clinic that was, um, being attended to uh, by one of the, I'm not going to name who it is right now. All of this stuff, by the way, is in uh, my newsletter, the Epstein Project newsletter, and in my new book, um, Creating Epstein, Bill Barr, Jeffrey Epstein, uh, Leslie Wexner, and the CIA. Um, however, these clinics, suddenly there were so many clinics for all of the hippies and they were free and you can just walk in there and get free medicine while well, they were giving them LSD, right? And they were giving them all the um, psychedelic drugs and, and, and sort of doing all of that and, and the uh, birth control pills. And they were being used for these MK Ultra experiments without their knowledge. Uh, so Roman Polanski uh, was part of that group. It, it also included well-known actors. Um, it included uh, people that were 
well-established um, like Abigail Folger, who was the heiress to the coffee fortune. She was living temporarily at Sharon and uh, Roman Polanski's house in, on Los Cielo Drive where the murders occurred. It is believed that um, unlike what we have read is, is through the books that we have been given on Charles Manson, it is believed that they were having uh, satanic rituals. Um, so Sharon Tate, for example, is the daughter of a military man. Uh, it is also believed that she had been sexually abused as a child. Roman Polanski uh, lost his parents when he was very young and uh, you know, he was born in Poland. And when the war began and Poland was occupied by Nazi Germany, um, he lost his parents and he lived in a series of foster homes. Uh, so right there, you can see that he too may have been victim uh, of child abuse because he developed a lot of people who are victims of child abuse, uh, develop a, a, a desire to, because they never grow. It's called the Peter Pan syndrome. So you never grow up to be a, an adult. And so you, you, you sort of stay stunted at a very young age, which is leads to people like Roman Polanski then later, um, raping a 13 year old girl. Would you agree that it kind of has a, a, a sort of a pr propensity to lead to you become a victim once you are a victim, Daryl? Oh, absolutely. It reproduces itself, as you have mentioned before, transgenerationally, intra familiar uh, within the family uh, manifested in, and this by the way is in Rosemary, son of Rosemary, it can manifest itself as incest, mother, son, incest. Yeah, uh, that's interesting because I, I, when I went back a hundred years or so and found something, there, there was something about that there. Um, so as everyone knows, the, there was a brutal slaying of the, and it's called the Tate LaBianca murders um, in 1969. And that happened a year after uh, the filming of Rosemary's Baby. Rosemary's Baby was a, uh, the first book that was written by Ira Levin, and I'm going to go back and describe Ira Levin's childhood, where he was born, when he, where he went to school, and I'll go into Rosemary's Baby, which I know you've read, right? Absolutely, and I read the first one as well, which really spells it all out. The Three Sisters. A Kiss Before Dying. Yeah, which was made twice. Uh, there was an original 60s one, and it, I found that it was remade. I have to watch them. But the, the book is really the template for what Ira Levin is all about. Yeah, sisters are an important component. I think anyone who's been following the Jeffrey Epstein case uh, has been made aware that, uh, and we only know, quite frankly, we only know about the sisters that did not go with the program, right, that sort of broke free. We don't know much, or at least the general public doesn't know much about the sisters who stayed in the, I'm going to call it cult for the time being. Um, but, you know, I've done some research. <laughs> and so uh, they end up being, you know, very prominent uh, officials within the banks, uh, the Federal Reserve System, the, the large banking families. Um, so to uh, get back to, uh, Roman Polanski was not uh, successful. Pretty much the film and the book uh, that Ira Levin created via his first vehicle, Rosemary's Baby, was the same. It's like a template uh, of Roman Polanski. In the book, it's an aspiring actor with his new wife, and Roman Polanski had just married Sharon Tate in 1968. Um, he's struggling. In the book, the actor is struggling. They move into the Dakota and strange things happen. And as we all know, uh, Rosemary is impregnated with the uh, child of Satan. Um, but I do want to um, explain 
who Roman Polanski's friend Ira Levin is, because as you so correctly pointed out for a long time, nothing is online of him. So I'm going to just go over his childhood. He was born in uh, New York City, really kind of like in the Bronx, so not Manhattan. He was born in the Bronx in um, 1929 on August 27th. He died in New York City on November the 12th of 2007. He, his father was uh, Charles um, Levin. He was a toy importer and his offices were at the Toy Center in Manhattan on 23rd Street on Fifth Avenue. That's an interesting place. His mother is Beatrice Shalonsky. Um, she was known uh, during her lifetime as Bessie. She was born in New York City as well. Um, they were both, his parents were Russian Jewish immigrants. Um, when he was a little boy, he began, he was very fascinated with magic. And he began going to the stores that sold the supplies for professional magicians. And he taught himself how to be a magician. And I've heard you say that when you read um, Jeffrey Epstein, Predator Spy, which is one of my books, you realize the importance of magicians, right? And, and the use of magic. Absolutely. So um, whenever I see someone has an interest in magic, I'm like, oh, okay, I have to look at this person a little bit care more carefully. <laughs> So the fact that he became uh, interested in magic as a very young boy um, tells me that he, you know, it, 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 became, it was of use to him later on. Um, his father was a well-to-do man, so he sent him to the Horace Mann School, uh, which is an Ivy League preparatory school in Riverdale. Riverdale is a, an affluent area of the Bronx in New York City. And it happens to be the very same school where Donald Barr, the headmaster of Dalton sent his son, Bill Barr. This is an interesting school. Um, the headmaster of Horace Mann, you, there are a couple of them that then sent their children to Dalton School in Manhattan and then some of the headmasters, including Donald Barr, sent his children to the other school for different reasons, but they're kind of similar schools. Um, Horace Mann at the time that um, both uh, Bill Barr went and before then when Ira Levin went was an all boys school. They had a very strict dress code. They wore shirts and ties and jackets, blazers. They had to have their hair cut. They had to address each other in a very um, professional way. So you're a 14 year old kid and you have to say to the other kid, Mr. Levin, Mr. Barr. And um, that's how they were uh, sort of, these are going to be the future masters of the universe. Um, in 1946, through 1948, uh, Ira Levin goes to Drake University, which again, it's a private school. Uh, so, so his father spares no expense. He sends him to a private school in Iowa. Uh, there are, the school typically offers undergraduate programs in business, in law, and in pharmacy, which is interesting when you have that pharmacy connection and he already likes magic and you know, you can only imagine what he must have been experimenting with as far as, you know, drinks maybe that he could use later. Um, he left uh, Drake University and in 1948 through 1950, he attended New York University where he studied English and philosophy, uh, basically obtaining a bachelor's degree in philosophy. You, New York University is a very, very important school. And as you know, having been a professor of a university, you know that they're connected to intelligence, right? 
Absolutely. And as you said, in one of your videos, they're very much involved in the real estate business. It's all vertically integrated. I Absolutely. lived in NYU faculty housing. They own the entire building. Same with Columbia. Columbia University is our la largest property owner uh, and the only other uh, corporation, I'm going to call it, nonprofit that matches the holdings of Columbia University uh, is the archdiocese, is the Catholic Church. So right. those two are our biggest um, property owners. New Which York is also mentioned in Rosemary's Baby, by the way. There's a oh. whole Catholic Roman Catholic subtext that's not in the film. Oh, interesting. Could you tell me about that since I haven't read the book in a long time? Well, it so happens that uh, Rosemary, um, her, her maiden name is Riley. She's Irish or American, mm -hmm. a Roman Catholic, large family who's fallen away from the church, which gives the cast of Ed's an opportunity to induct her into the coven. But uh, it happens, her impregnation by, by Satan happens to coincide with the visit to New York City of the Pope. So That's he doesn't true. spell it out too carefully, but if you if you have your radar out there, you, you might be able to infer that perhaps it was the Pope, the Antichrist, the great Satan that impregnated Rosemary uh, Woodhouse. And that is not really drawn out too much in the, in the film, because mm -hmm. I'm afraid that uh, Charles Bloodhorn, which who's another German immigrant, mm -hmm. uh, who was the, the, the CEO of Gulf and Western, I think they thought, oh, my gosh, the, the, the archdiocese, um, mm -hmm. Cardinal Spellman's mafia, they might get really upset about that, but they can get away with it in a book. That's why it's important to read, read all of it. I agree. I think it's important to read the, um, the first edition specifically before they start changing and editing things. Mm -hmm. um, New York University um, is also where Jeffrey Epstein went to school. Um, I think everyone knows he began in 1971 and he stopped in 1974 at the very same time that Seymour Hirsch began to out uh, the CIA's covert atrocities against um, citizens, it, which, which included the MKUltra program and many other uh, things. And it led to the 1975 church committee hearings. And so in 1974, uh, Jeffrey Epstein goes to New York University, which, by the way, is a holding pen for uh, sleeper spies. So, for example, Aviem Sela is a Mossad agent who was taking courses at New York University while he was, you know, kind of in New York City, but you, you don't want to know that he's a spy, so he's a student. However, he recruited Jonathan Pollard while he was at New York University. And so it's interesting that um, IR-11 ends up at New York University. And so just to um, Avi Msela, who recruited Jonathan Pollard, then sent Pollard and introduced Pollard to Rafi Eitan. And Rafi Eitan was considered an Israeli super spy and he's connected to the theft of the promised software. And I will be hopefully at some point in this conversation explaining how the promised software keeps track of all the sex slaves. And so they're not only sex slaves. I'm going to say that, as I said in my previous video, that there's an overclass and there's an underclass. And I'm sorry to say, um, Daryl, but you and I are the underclass. We're all the slaves. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I figured that out years ago. Right. And then Promise keeps track of all of us. And I'll explain. And Promise features what's interesting is that it does feature in one of Ira Levin's books. And I think no one, no one has figured that out. Um, so, uh, Rafi Eitan, it's important to say that he was Robert Maxwell's uh, handler. And Robert Maxwell, under the guidance of Rafi Eitan and Ariel Sharon, and by the way, Ariel Sharon was financed by Michelin Rickless, who is Ira Rickless's father and who turned me into his sex slave for a period of eight years and who has spied 
on me for decades and who has tried to have me murdered more than once and not allegedly I know this for a fact and it's the reason I'm here and in this story because um, I continue to look for the pieces of this large puzzle which has one root it's all connected um, so uh, Ira Levin goes to U New York University and just like um, just like, um, wait, I'm trying to remember because there's so many people, um, just like Donald Barr's son, Bill Barr, before he finishes school, he's already got a job. So before Bill Barr even finished uh, going to Horace Mann, and that's just a high school, he was already working for the CIA. Granted, his father, Donald Barr, was part of the OSS. So I have to assume that with um, Ira Levin's father working as a wealthy toy importer, and as I said earlier, the toy building is a very important building in New York City. It's also one of these classic buildings uh, built during the 19, early 1900s. It was a a perfect place for a spy to hide because uh, you had somebody like Mattel, a company like Mattel, which had the Barbie dolls, which were an impossible um, aspiration for any woman to want to, to become like a Barbie doll. Uh, and it was also a place where with the Hollywood movies, there were showrooms there for uh, the merchandise that then the Hollywood movies would, would produce. And so for him to have had an office at the toy center as an importer, um, I worked there as a teenager and you can't get access to the building unless you work there or you're a buyer during toy week, which still happens to present day. So I would think that his father who was also a military man uh, was connected in some way to intelligence because before he finishes NYU, he's already been sort of connected to CBS and NBC. And so as a college senior, uh, Levin had, theoretically, he entered a television screenwriting contest sponsored by CBS and that he was a runner up and he sold a screenplay to NBC, uh, then, in 1951. So he's already writing while he's still a co college senior. It's interesting. And he's working for CBS and NBC, which what we learned during the church committee hearings of 1975 by Sig Miggleton, who was the uh, president of CBS, while he's being questioned by the church committee that yes, when he began working at CBS in the mid 1950s, so I think it was 1954, he said that the uh, station already had a pre-existing um, agreement with the CIA, meaning that they would put on the news whatever they wanted, which wouldn't you call that propaganda and fake news? Absolutely. The, the key name there is William Paley, who was the president of CBS, who had military and intelligence connection. He and his wife, Babe Paley, were the ultimate power couple. And it all, uh, let's say, percolated downward from the chief Paley, William Paley. Yeah. I think uh, Seymour Hersh has written extensively about these media combines, uh, the New York Times, uh, CBS, NBC, and ABC, which is kind of a spinoff of because of monopoly issues. At least that was the official reason. But the real reason was to, to create these three false choices of networks, as you mentioned in your earlier video, ABC, CBS, NBC. Yes. And I love that phrase, false choices, because that they were all saying the same thing. And you're right. <laughs> it's like, it's it's almost like it, it, the mentality of we're giving you a choice, but you really have none, right? Yes, between Coke and Pepsi. <laughs> okay, all right. I see why we're new, newly acquired siblings. 
<laughs> okay. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, so in um, he he uh, begins working for uh, the United States Army Corps. So basically, he joins the United States Army, but not in a regular capacity the way normal people would in 1953. He goes to work for the Army Signal Corps for two years until 1955. But what does the Army Signal Corps have a young IRA-11 do? They don't send him out to do the hard, dirty work, no. They let him sit in an office where he writes training manuals for the rest of the United States Army. Um, it's important to note that the United States Army Signal Corps creates and manages communications and information systems for the command and control of all of the combined forces. It was established in 1860. Uh, it had a, a very important role in the American Civil War and its responsibility includes new technology uh, that's eventually transferred to other government entities, right? So it includes information on military intelligence, weather forecasting, and aviation. Um, so while he's in the army, it's amazing. The man, uh, while we see that he has sort of some kind of like writing break, so he's only written seven books, right? And he writes for television, but he's writing while he's in the army for television. So there has to be a symbiotic connection there. And he publishes his first book, A Kiss Before Dying in 1953. Um, the military connection, I just want to explain to everyone that before the CIA was created in 1947, the Office of Strategic Services uh, preceded it. And that was created in 1942. Before the Office of Strategic Services, which is referred to with just the initials OSS, the United States depended on its armed forces. So it depended on the Air Force, on the Navy, on the Army. Um, and in my the last time that you had me on the show, I explained the Montauk Project and how the Navy then agreed to have once Seymour Hersh exposed the MK Ultra program, how it was, then the Nazi scientists went straight to the Navy and said, hey, we don't wanna stop this program obviously. And the Navy set up the fake military air force base on Montauk, remember? Yes. Okay, so then um, the military is, is very much involved in all of this. Um, while writing for television, he produces um, his, he's still very early 20s. And it pretty much, it tells a story of a very cold blooded guy. He wants upward mobility. He doesn't have any money. Uh, so he decides that he's going to marry uh, the daughter of a wealthy man. And lo and behold, he happens to have three daughters. So when he gets her pregnant, he knows the father is not going to go with the program because he's, you know, he's he's not going to be welcome into the family. So he kills her, and then he begins all over again with the sister. This um, is a kiss before <laughs> dying, right? A kiss before yeah. dying. Yes. Okay. And it, by 1954, he he wins an Edgar Award for the best first novel uh, for Mystery Writers of America. There's a reason that Ira Levin has a lot of information that belongs to the future. And I'm going to be wrapping around and explaining how he has all this, because it seems like he has a lot of pre-knowledge of things. Um, his agent, by the way, uh, Daryl, was Harold Ober. Does that name sound familiar to you? Uh, I know of a producer named William Ober. Are they related? They might be. In the early uh, days, by the way, he was writing for the so-called golden age of television. Yeah. That's where all this uh, propaganda was being uh, coalescing. And uh, you'll get into it later. Ain't targeted particularly to people like me, the baby boomers and the children's shows. Yeah, those children's shows are evil. We'll get, to, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll get to that. I'm surprised but, but, that I made it through. Maybe I didn't. I don't know. 
but okay. yes. But but all of them, even Mickey Mouse, uh, you know, they're, they're the early Mickey Mouse from the 1920s and the 1930s, they're spanking. Uh, the mouse is spanking himself and being allowed to be spanked. It's and uh, the Road Runner. I mean, all of these cartoons just had so much violence. And it's it's. I used to think, you know, as I watched the cartoons, why there was so much violence. Because I would think, as a child, if I did that, I would be dead, you know. And all of the buildings falling on the cartoons and just smashing. I mean, it was just um. We we grew up at during violent times watching these cartoons. And to present day, the cartoons have not really changed much. Now, um, Kirby, there were the there was the violence. Yeah, I you know I grew up to that that era, and then the other part of the dialectic because Oz works in pairs, right? Twins. Yep. Dialectic. The other one was the soft, fuzzy puppet shows. Yeah. Kukula, Fran, and Ollie, the Sherry Lewis show, uh, and then more recently, Sesame Street. And we all know what happened to Jim Henson. Yep. Yeah, very, everything. By the way, um, I'll say it now. I was going to say it later, but I'll say it now that the, um, and I just, just want to, as usual, I have tons of notes. <laughs> um, or maybe I should say it later, but um, the clown shows too no no well <laughs> bozo's big top there's an agency that um whose name i will find but there's an agency a government agency that oversees oh fcc all, federal yes, communications the, yes commission. thank you for that yes the federal communications uh commission um pretty much because everything goes through the radio waves. So they, um, not only were they instrumental in creating these children's shows, they actually told ABC, CBS, and, and the other one, so ABC, NBC, and CBS, what they wanted. And, and th there's um, a very long report, which in fact, I'll send you a copy of that I found during my research that of a meeting they had in San Francisco in 1974 in their office located on Masonic Avenue, which used to be a, it used to be a, um, a cemetery and they just took the bodies out and ditched them, built their offices <laughs> there. They're very kind people, but they are responsible for what's on the airwaves. It to, to present day. And they're, they're also the, the um, agency that regulates your alarm system in your home, because Ira had all the alarm companies. And I thought, oh, I can just reach out to FCC and tell them what Ira has done to me. And because you need to have a, a no felonies, uh, it's sort of like having a, a license uh, for a casino in Las Vegas, which is why the CIA and the mobsters had intermediary men like Michelle and Rickless is if you, you could not have a you, you could not have been a felon to run a casino you can't be a felon to operate an alarm company or to have and he had the largest wholesale alarm company so I thought I would reach out to the FCC and tell them that this man is a criminal and this is what he's done the FCC uh, didn't want to hear from me and I, you know, in hindsight, I, I then compared it to um, Mark Opolis, who outed uh, uh, Bernie Madoff, who the Securities and Exchange Commission didn't want to hear from, because all of the agencies of our federal government, they work for our masters, and it's not us. So we're the slaves. Um, and um, so the FCC, frankly, is involved in the creation of these really very peculiar uh, television shows, puppets, and so on and so forth. Um, and currently, they're the overlords of 5G, which is also a mind control technology. They don't need the content anymore. They can just go straight with the frequencies. Yeah, I mean, 
And, 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 you know, people, most people, you don't think about it. You just think that each station or each show has its own producer, but no, they're basically um, guided by the FCC as to what you're going to, you're going to see. Um, and for that, don't you think it's very odd that they had their offices on <laughs> Masonic, Masonic's driver street in San Francisco, but oh, in, Kirby, I guess it's just one of those coincidences <laughs> of history, all of these coincidences. So <laughs> to uh, get back to our friend, Ira Levin. Um, so, okay. He's in the United States army and he's writing and he's already doing work with the stations. Um, He becomes friendly with um, the Hollywood people, but I, I think that I, that I might have some more information. I just want to get as much of, of Ira Levin info as I can here because there's not a lot out there. So, and I spent a lot of time looking for uh, whatever I could. Um, so just bear with me and let me just get back to my spot here. Okay, so he gets a degree uh, in 1950 in philosophy. Um, his father basically said to him, because apparently he wanted to become a writer, at least that's how the story goes, that he would subsidize him for two years and that if he didn't succeed, uh, he would then go work for his father in the toy industry. Um, well, he never had to go to work with his father in the toy industry because one thing led to another and, you know, he wrote Kiss Before Dying and it was somewhat successful. It became a movie. Um, he won that award for, you know, the Edgar Award in 1954 from the Mystery Writers of America. His literary agent was Harold Ober, whose clients... Oh, yes included William Faulkner, Agatha Christie, Langston Hughes, H.G. Wells, okay? And then, um, so you have H.G. Wells with the Time Machine and War of the Worlds. Uh, later, he would be represented by Phyllis Westberg. That was his agent at the time of his death. Um, so he, he produced plays, he produced... Uh, scripts for both radio and television because there was a time when radio was very popular. Um, I think you covered the fact that he did No Time for Sergeants, right? He did the screenplay, yes, adaptations. By the way, when he published um, A Kiss Before Dying, he was all of 23 years old. And that book is the product of a mature imagination. You'd have to be 40 years old to have lived that type of life. But yeah, he was only I mean, 23. I agree. Can you uh, uh, help us uh, understand what No Time for Sergeants was about? Yes, it, it was a uh, sort of a military slash comedy for the returning uh, veterans who are traumatized, which is part of the process, by the way. Uh, a lot of these people that were working in, in the military, including Ira Levin, who came later, people like uh, J.D. Salinger and uh, uh, a whole roster, even Gore Vidal was in the military, and I think you cover him as well. He was one mm -hmm. of the residents of the Hotel Marmont, but No Time for Sergeants was a, first it was a novel, but then, uh, which was a, com a comedic novel, but then it was a very, very popular, I think Andy Griffith might have Gotten, maybe it was the other one, A Face in the Crowd, where he won an Academy Award. And we, as a television generation, know him, Andy Griffith, as um, the kindly uh, sheriff of um, this idyllic little rural community in the Andy Griffith show. And his little son was none other than, yeah. who later became an important director, Ron Howard. He was Back then he was called Ronnie Howard. So that was Andy Griffith. That was, uh, that was his... His claim, I guess it was a face in the crowd, which was really catapulted him, but then they put him in this comedy film and then he became a fixture of television. Uh, 
And then he became Matlock. He became a detective. That's true. Now, Andy Griffith is a guy that needs to be (laughs) delved into. He's not very sexy or really an eye catcher, but those are the very type, the the type of people that that we need to look at. Well, you know, it's always the quiet ones, right? Because Ira (laughs) Levin was set uh, by people who knew him to be a soft-spoken guy, that he was a nice guy, that he kept to himself. Andy Griffith seems to fit that mold. Absolutely. They have a dark side, it seems. Yeah. Um, so, he, yeah, so that uh, the No Time for Sergeants kind of launched the career of Andy Griffith, and it was a play that was turned into a movie in 1958, co-starring Nicholas Adams. I don't know who he is. So I didn't really look for him. And it's uh, also No Time for Sergeants is considered the precursor to Gomer Pyle, another kind of like sitcom of the, what, the 1960s, right? With um, mm. a goofy looking guy. And it was oh, supposed to be Oh, by the way, Nick, Nick Adams was in uh, Rebel Without a Cause. He was part oh. of the early 50s. Uh, when the studio system was breaking down, they brought in a new crop of uh, gay actors. And he, he was one of them, Sal Minio, James Dean. Yeah, he was like a second banana to James Dean. That's Nick. He later became known as Nick Adams when he got his own TV show. But it's all very uh, queer. Uh, the term these days they use is queer. That's what GLBT people call it. But it's very queered out very early on. And that's a very important part of the control uh, system back in the 1950s when homosexuality, lesbianism was still a cultural, social, and in certain cases, a legal uh, taboo. Right. Well, it's interesting because uh, Levin was married twice um, and um, he had three sons with one of his, well, with his second wife. And one of them, uh, you know, has, is, has lived a gay life, which is interesting. Um, he also, by the way, um, I think you, you mentioned that he uh, lived in Long Island. And while uh, when he married his first wife, they did decide to settle down in Long Island. Um, at some point, he did get an apartment on Park Avenue in Millionaires in the area known as Millionaires Row. Are you familiar mm-hmm. with that? Oh, yes. Park Avenue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and so that area in the in the eighties in New York City on the East Side um, is was known as Millionaires Row. I mean, in fact, in New York we had um, I believe it was in twenty ten we had a Millionaires March. I was part of that, and uh, but it's not really all the billionaires who live there. Um, and he had uh, an apartment there um, as as well as you know, his home in the country. Um, He wrote the seven books that you've discussed, but if you don't mind, may I just repeat them to the audience one more time? Oh, please. Yeah. They're all back in print, by the way. So this is our opportunity. (laughs) Yes. Okay. So in 1953, he writes A Kiss Before Dying. Uh, In 1967, he writes Rosemary's Baby, which by the way, it's only approximately 200 pages. Um, in, ni- in 1970, uh, he writes This Perfect Day, which is published in 1985. There are no films uh, made of This Perfect Day. In 1972, it's a novella that he writes. It's only 125 pages, and it's The Stepford Wives. Um, in 1976, he writes The Boys from Brazil. And... Um, the, in 1970, 1991, he writes Sliver. And then his last book is written in 1997, which is Son of Rosemary. So you've read which ones? I read uh, Kiss Before Dying, then the second one, Rosemary's Babies, which, which came uh, many, many years later, I think 15 years later. Then I skipped to Son of Rosemary. I had to read the sequel, which was kind of a parody, and I think intentionally so, because so many years had passed and, and people were really beginning to do deep dives into the film, uh, given Roman Polanski's uh, past. And I think he, he put a, a light touch on it and um, he made it all into a dream. It's, it was a real cop out at, at the end. 
but he does give because you know a lot of these uh, people like to serial killer i'm saying he was a serial killer but these people <laughs> because they have this the sense of superiority they just yeah. love to live leave clues for we slaves right so the even yeah. though it's a bad book it's inferior to the, the original book son of rosemary mm -hmm. uh it's dotted with uh, clues and that's where the 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 real data points are in the clues that he leaves behind well, I have some surprises for you based on that last book, and okay. um, I'm going to save that for the last because <laughs> it even bowled me over. It, it takes a lot to bowl me over, um, and it comes back to your puppets and red hair that we know Rosemary's baby, the child has red hair. That's the sign of the devil. Um, however, I found the source for this, and everyone is going to be surprised. However, I want to go back and into Rosemary's baby. Um, he chose the Dakota. The Dakota is um, a landmark building in New York City. It was built, it took four years to build. It began in 19, I'm sorry, in eight, 1880. It was finished in 1884. Um, it was a blend of uh, Renaissance, modern, Gothic, and Victorian architectures. Um, it's pretty much one of the first high rises in New York City. Um, it, the, the person that decided to create the Dakota uh, was Edward Clark. He is the sort of the owner with his partner of the Singer Sewing Machine Company. He died in, 19, in 1882, um, so he did not get to live at the Dakota. At the time that he was throwing a million dollars and at the time that was a lot of money you know a million dollars back in 1880 was a lot of money to build this apartment building they they said of him they oh this is clark's folly um that he, he was making a dramatic mistake because it was so far uptown it you know people in those days were got around in horse and buggies and also the wealthy people of New York, which is really what New York was for. It was for the masters and the slaves lived in tenement buildings, sharing bunk beds, five, you know, five cents. It was just, it, it, it was really a tale of two cities is, is what New York was like. Um, however, it, it, his, because he didn't get to live there in 1882, uh, it is said that his ghost still haunts the Dakota. There are, in fact, many ghost stories uh, about the Dakota. Um, it was not built for the rich people. It was built for people who were aspiring to be wealthy. Um, so that if you were hmm. upward mobility, um, you ended up renting an apartment at the Dakota. It had features um, that would later be replicated, in fact, in today's uh, world in New York City. So uh, it had a gym, uh, which is unusual, right? Because uh, physical fitness was not something that was uh, thought of back in that day. The top floors, it was a 10-story building, so not very tall uh, compared to high rises of today but tall for the time because of in, at where it was built on 72nd Street and later uh, John Lennon would live there with Yoko Ono. Judy Garland had an apartment there. But at the time, 10 stories was considered a very uh, tall thing, tall building. But from the very beginning, it was, it was rumored uh, by the people who lived there and by the workers that it was a haunted place. Um, and there have been apparitions and um, all of this weird stuff. Weird accidents have happened in front of the Dakota. People have gotten, residents who have lived in the building have gotten hit by a, a random taxi cab as they get, it's just been a very weird building. And as we know, John Lennon lost his life at the Dakota. Um, and this is the building that, um, Levin uh, chose as the setting for Rosemary's baby. Now, it's my understanding that he, when it was made, the book was turned over in a very short time. I mean, so he writes the book 
in what, 1970, 1978, right? E 77, is it? In 1967, he writes the book. In 1968, yeah. he and Roman Polanski are now make, making the film. So Polanski takes the book, turns it into a screenplay. That's very quick, I think, and from where I sit, you know, knowing yeah. about the industry. So, I think it was a package. There was a pack. There, the, the agents got in very early, saying this is going to be a novel slash film. Yeah, That's and, what I think. Yeah, and and I, I really believe that Rosemary's Baby is the mirror image of Roman Polanski's uh, sacrifice of Sharon Tate and his firstborn. Um, that's what I believe. And I believe that it was orchestrated by Ira Levin, who was already part of this circle. And what, what we have to know about the circle is that they recruit others. So right. it's not just the children that recruit other children. Um, and Kirby, you, you alluded to the LaBianca murders, the couple, one of them was the, the husband was Lino and the, and the wife was Rosemary yes. LaBianca. Yes, and 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 that's where I think they got the name Rosemary. Um, I don't think anything is a coincidence here. Um, so it's it, Rosemary's baby is so. Then you have Mia Farrow, who is connected to. She was married at the time that the film was being. Uh, I you know it was sort of like. There are photographs of Mia Farrow sitting in front of the Dakota. There was a lot of filming going on of the exterior of the building because it's a very architecturally interesting and very kind of gothic, very scary looking building still to present day. Um, they apparently ended up getting, um, doing the film in Hollywood, right? So we're sort of, they recreated the interior of the building, the apartments of the building. Um, what's interesting is that she, Mia Farrow, is, is a young New York City bride um, who, whose husband is an aspiring writer. He hasn't made it. They move into this building. They're befriended by an, a friendly older couple who happen to be Satanists. Um, she is drugged. Now, the, the, the theme of women as vessels, as I'm going to, I'm just going to call it this for temporarily as sex slaves. It, 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 I can see that throughout all of his work, it's a very misogynistic view. We can see that in Stepford Wives. We can see it almost in all of his all of his work, it's, it's a very misogynistic view of women. Um, the character uh, who plays Rosemary's Baby's um, husband also makes a deal with the devil. So pretty, pretty much in this movie, they're telling us what's going to happen and what actually did happen with Roman Polanski, in my opinion. And I'm I, you know, I'm saying it's my opinion so that nobody gets up in arms here. It's my opinion based on my research that this is what happened because it completely mirrors what happens to Rosemary, uh, who, by the way, when Charles Manson, it, the, the, the official story is that the Manson family broke into the house. What I've been able to ascertain is that Roman Polanski used to have crazy parties. These were parties where, you know, there was couple swapping, where there were uh, multiple people doing the same thing, if everybody catches my drift, where there were actually even satanic rituals in the house. And that the night of the murder, um, that actually they, they were part of the, they were doing a satanic ritual and the members of the Charles Manson family, in fact, were already friends of Ira Levin and Roman Polanski and also of Sharon Tate, and that it went wrong. Um, it was a horrific murder. Um, they made her watch as all of the other people were murdered. Then they cut the baby 
out. They were going to cut out, I'm sorry to be gruesome, but I just want as many details here as possible because who knows if anybody will ever do this. It, remember you and I uh, know the significance of the eyes, uh, two ball cane and all of that? Absolutely. Well, what, what they planned to do, but they ran out of time was they were gonna cut out her eyes and the eyes of the other people, uh, as well as their fingers. Um, they didn't have time to do that. Uh, I was able to find information uh, of that in the uh, court documents. So in order to really research, you can't, you can't like, like Professor Hamamoto tells you all the time, it's not, research is not Googling. <laughs> <laughs> you picked that up huh? i do because you're so okay. right people yeah. think sometimes i'll tweet something and then somebody in two seconds gives me an answer that it's like i don't need for you to really say this because this is not research research is going through the court records research is 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 comparing not just your court records but comparing historical information so for me i go through old newspaper accounts I go through, I look at comments because comments are interesting because years ago there would be boards and there are ways to get on those boards to see what people say, you know, who were alive at the time and who heard inside information. So it's important to get information from various sources um, and you can't do that with uh, a search engine. I don't care what search engine you use. You need to really do your, your homework. And doing your homework takes, as you can see, I, I do this seven days a week and I'm, you know, I'm still. Uh, and as an example of the, of the types of, of uh, correlations one can make by doing the type of homework that Kirby Summers does, she just mentions the importance of eyes, but also she, she got into a Jeffrey Epstein's art collection, which were these collection of glass eyes. Yeah, so he had, a, you know, I've never, I've, I, I, I did not know Jeffrey Epstein. I, I, I know of Jeffrey Epstein. I was never in his house. The way that I replicated the interior of his home is because um, one of the victims uh, knew exactly what the house looked like, you know, mm -hmm. and I've, I've become friendly with several of the victims and I was able to replicate the interior of his house um, all the floors, everything um, based on information I obtained. And I put that into Jeffrey Epstein, Predator Spy. But also mainstream media did report on the eyeball co co collection that Jeffrey Epstein had um, in, in the foyer area. And that correlated to Jimmy Savile's collection of eyes. And by the way, the eyes were real eyes. Uh, it, I was told by one of the victims that the eyeballs, which were uh, eyeballs co connect collected um, of people who had been injured during the war. World War One, right? Yeah. Uh -huh. That it inserted into these eyeballs, which were individually uh, encased in glass, they inserted a, a you know a surveillance camera, so that it was an eye within an eye. And as you know, Jimmy Savile, who and all of these uh, child uh, trafficking rings and these men like Savile and Epstein and Mark Dutro and Craig Spence and Roy Cohn, all of these people are part of the same thing. They're part of uh, an intelligence connected um, uh, main center, if you will. Uh, and it, these are just branches of the same thing that we're seeing. It's not different. I think that what's kept us from reaching this truth is that people focus on individual crimes instead of stepping back and looking at the patterns and the similarities. So you caught the, 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 the eye situation, which I also included a chapter in Jeffrey Epstein, Predator Spy, of Queen Elizabeth the first and um, what was his name? Um, uh, John, John the magician John D, and the you know the way that he would sign uh, 007 to Queen Elizabeth when writing to her, 
as a sign that you know he was her advisor, he was her eyes, and then that's where we get 007 from. Did you remember reading that or no? Oh, absolutely. And uh, if the audience wants to check out my two part um, series on Ian Fleming, I build that out. Ian Fleming is, is another very important cultural figure who, again, is giving us these coded messages through popular fiction. You know, I, I watched your series on Ian Fleming. You did a spectacular job. Um, you read all the books and you point out all of the all of the clues he gives the world. Absolutely. So, yeah, everybody. You know you what? To... Most of these individuals have co uh, inner conflicts about what they're doing. They're not 100% sold into the satanic uh, universe. And the way they resolve that is, is through these totemic rituals of, uh, of art, either it could be music, sculpture, but in this case, we're talking about popular fiction. And, and I'm saying this because that is to our advantage. If we can pick them apart, like Kirby Summers, <laughs> you have to do uh, well, your, you your do research. Well, you do the same thing, though. Oh, we, oh, yeah. Well, that's yeah. why we, we work so well together. Yeah, we, we do. I, we have a very, very similar outlook on life, number one, which means, you know, it's divided between masters and slaves. All right. There you go. And then secondly, our uh, methodology, our, our approaches are very similar. We're, we're not Googlers. And that's really that really irritates me when he goes, oh, yeah, you got to look at so and so. And I said, that, that's a Googler. That's not that's not what I do. No, and, and I love you for that, because every time you say it, I jump up and down when I'm watching you. And then I'll rewatch, you know, because it's like, did he really say that? Yes, he did. Yes. And so I've become a little bit like you. I'm like, don't, 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 don't use a search engine. You know, I've become a little bit more like you. And um, look, I think if everybody learns how to do research in the right way, there are that many more hands helping. We need as much help as we can, because. I'm, I, I, I've been a sex slave. I don't want to be a slave anymore. And I'm sure you've been a sex slave for, not a sex slave, but you were a slave for the university. You don't want to be a slave forever. No. Okay. They so tried to make me into a sex slave, a gay really? sex slave. Oh yeah, absolutely. Can yeah, you just but expand I, I did on not that? give, pardon me? Can you expand on that? Yeah, they're into uh, sacred anality. It, they call it the higher sodomy, and it's very much related to empire building, because uh, when you're uh, busy exploiting uh, brown or black people or yellow people around the other side of the world, you don't have women with you. You just have other men. And you also have uh, little boys like Joey Ito and those and, right. and women that you can exploit. So that is the, uh, the, the ritual bond is uh, I call it sacred anality. That's my own phrase. Well, how did they try to get you to be part of that? Uh, it's just the classic grooming process. They wine you, they dine you, oh. they flatter you, they promise you status and position. Right. They, uh, they give you tenure. They give you an endowed chair. I know tons of people who have, there's this one woman who who is groomed from the, the beginning. Who She sits in an endowed chair at Yale University. She came out of nowhere. And they like people who, come, who are kind of like mid-range, not the super elite, but kind of in the, I call them the servitor class. Right. They're not really down and out. They're kind of in the middle. They're wannabes. They have their, their nose pressed to the window. In the early days, they use Jews because of their sort of middleman position. These days, right. they use Asian Americans. So you're going to see a lot of Chinese, particularly a lot of Koreans. And you're already seeing tons of South Asians. Mm -hmm who were fulfilling the position that Jews once were put into by this larger elite, which are not Jewish, by the way, they're probably, uh, well, I, they're on the Christian end of it, let's say. That's interesting. <laughs> yeah, um, uh, Vatican, because Ira Levin put those clues in there. He said, don't blame us, you know, take a look mm -hmm. at the Vatican. Of course, he can't write that in the book, but he left enough clues for us. So whereas he but, was not a good guy, right? Yeah. Even in the worst person, and this is part of, you know, the Christian um, theology, there's a redemptive character uh, uh, elements within them that we should be able to, to um, use for our own purposes. They're, that's their form of saying, just listen, I had to do this for whatever reason. I regret it. Uh, Stanley Kubrick regretted it. He tried to pay penance by doing that 
incredible movie, Eyes Wide Shut. And um, Kirby, someone like you is is digging through it, sifting through it, and and peeling back the layers to show the redemptive process of research. It is a religious, it's a holy enterprise. I have come to conclude after the end of two years, over two years of being pounded by the ultimate in humiliation, yeah. which is bioslavery. Um, there's a book uh, that he wrote, in fact, on the heels of having written Rosemary's Baby. So in 1970, he writes This Perfect Day, and there's no film made of This Perfect Day. And This Perfect Day, although it was written in 1970, pretty much uh, explains our situation today. So a uh, centuries into the future, uh, I'm just gonna just briefly go over it, if you don't mind. Um, the people of earth, all the people of earth, of every continent live under the control of an artificial intelligence uh, computer called Unicomp. So basically they call it Uni for short. Uh, the computers govern the five continents that basically have come together under what they call a unification. Um, so the entire society is not only controlled uh, by the elite, uh, they're given medication. Everybody dresses the same. Everyone wears a bracelet. No one has a high sex drive because they're constantly medicated. Um, they are, they eat the same thing. So they have like this horrible same meal every single day. Um, this perfect day, as far as the way that I see it, um, is exactly what's happening today. So uniformity is the defining feature. There's only one language. The ethnic groups have all been uh, merged into one race called the family, if that's not reminiscent of Charles Manson and his quote, the family. Um, and so there's, there's uh, uni, the has replaced God. Uh, people don't say thank God, they say thank uni. Um, by, by the time they're 62, they're no longer wanted. So they're, they're People who are kind and have reviewed this book say they're euthanized. I'm not that kind. I'm going to say they're murdered <laughs> uh, by the people who each person has a, um, it's like a therapist, but it's called something else. It's called sort of like a, an advisor. And you, the advisor makes sure that you stay perpetually drugged so that you don't have aspirations so that you're just like everybody else. They tell you where to live. They tell you when to eat. They tell you who to marry or they tell you when to reproduce. Men do not grow facial hair because their testosterone is low. Women do not develop breasts and it only rains at night. Um, this book more than anything else made me think about what's happening today. And in fact, it was this book that took me 100 to 100 years ago, and I'll get into that uh, in a little while because it was so, the clues from this book and also clues from the last book that he wrote, um, the sequel to the Rosemary's Baby book. Um, but, but you know, if you go through all his work, there are lines. So for example, you have the Stepford Wives, where the women are in this perfect town are all murdered and replaced by not even like i'm going to call them ai machines wouldn't you call them ais oh absolutely and there was that Sp uh, steven spielberg directed movie called ai 
Yeah, and Jeffrey Epstein, by the way, with uh, Bill Gates, created Sophia, the AI robot, who actually went to a, a meeting and was given um, citizen status. Uh, when I started uh, tweeting about two and a half years ago about uh, Sophia, the Hansen made computer that Jeffrey Epstein uh, and Bill Gates were involved in creating. And she is basically a replica of a 16 year old girl. And now they have the little Sophia. So she's like a 10 year old girl and people have sex with these dolls. They can buy them. The owner of Hansen came out and said, oh no, Epstein was not part of my company. So, you know, the lies that we have been told after Epstein has been caught uh, are, are continue. However, when I tweeted about it, um, no one has my cell phone number, literally, all, like 10 people have that number. I, and I, that's the only place where I can get a, a text message. I immediately received a text message from an anonymous uh, source telling me, oh, you're going in the wrong direction. Uh, you know, uh, it, you know, gave me a lecture on my cell phone about how it's not AI, I shouldn't be going into the AI, I'm going in the wrong. And so I, I was startled, but I've had so many odd things happen to me during the course of 30 years that it didn't frighten me. So what I did was I got on the phone and I tweeted back and I said, what, are you my deep throat? <laughs> <laughs> And I never heard back from whoever tried to steer me in the wrong. Isn't By the weird? way, that's a reference to an inside source, not 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 the movie <laughs> Linda Lovelace. But right, right. Yeah. Oh yes, it's a Deep Throat was a, theoretically this guy named Mark Felt, and mm. but later, as the truth has come out little by little, uh, even he felt is a is is a fallacy that it was just a source it was just a combination of different uh sources that uh woodward and bernstein had when they were breaking the watergate story mm -hmm. um so that the way that they got their material and their tips was from someone theoretically named deep throat who would leave them messages and that's the reference to deep throat um right yeah. So once I sent that text, I never heard back from the person, but I know that when I get pushback or when somebody tells me, oh, you're going in the wrong direction, I know I'm going in the right direction. <laughs> so um, that's what he did with Stepford wives. They, 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 they murder their wives. And what's, what's, what was interesting to me, and you must have read that book at some point, right? The, the final one, Son of Rosemary? No, the Stepford Wives. Oh, yes, yes, years ago, but not through the same lens as today. Uh, you know, the, the part about Ira Levin and people like even Ian Fleming or some of these other filmmakers, people like Stanley Kubrick is that, or even uh, George, George Orwell or uh, Aldous Huxley is that I can never really kind of figure out, maybe it's both, that they're warning us or taunting us or they're doing the, the same thing at the same time. I don't know. Because well, these are, if you read these books correctly, they're a warning to us. Well, I, I, I think that it's really more social engineering. I think that they, mm -hmm. we have writers today uh, that go to these conferences that Epstein used to go to. Mm -hmm. um, and again, I'm not gonna name too many names because, you know, um, but they write what's what's referred to as science fiction books. They're not really science fiction. Uh, they're just a, a prelude of what's going to come and they make money off of it. So they do become successful. They mm -hmm. get accolades. They're uh, rewarded with prizes as we see IR-11 was rewarded with prizes and money and prestige. That's what they want. I, I, I think that you're being very kind and thinking that they want to warn us. I don't see it that way. I think that they are taking advantage of the fact that they know they have pre-information. And so I want to just in, in this moment, reopen our last conversation where I said that in uh, the Jeffrey Epstein was part of the Lolita program 
uh, by Sidney Gottlieb, and that part of that MK Ultra program was time travel that the Montauk Project and the uh, Philadelphia experiment crashed into one. And that what that resulted in was the ability to do some time travel. And I, when I was on your show, I mentioned um, Mia Farrow's husband, uh, Woody Allen, as being able to do some time travel because we see that uh, in his film, uh, Midnight in Paris. So I think that these guys like uh, Levin had the ability of time travel and were able to see uh, what people call the dystopian future. They think it's science fiction. No, they're telling you what's going to happen. And so by putting it, the, the reason that intelligence allows them to put it in novels and in movies and in, in all kinds, wherever you, you look really, is we become des we do become desensitized. Uh, it happens so slowly. The, the the changes happen so slowly that by the time we're in it, like we are now, we're not that shocked, um, and we go with the program like like sheep to slaughter. Frankly, so it's it is the conditioning of the brain of our brains. Um, that's social engineering. That's so that it changes the perception. Uh, so that what we would perceive as evil, we don't see it as so evil. Uh, I see it as evil. I see Ira Levin as as bad as being an Anton, Anton LaVey. In fact, Anton LaVey was hired by Roman Polanski. Uh, he was in the film and he's the person who plays the devil and who rapes uh, the Mia Farrow character. Um, so you're very kind to see good in people, even bad people. Well, I guess that's the Christian in me that, you know, you can, <laughs> to, to the point, you, you can confess your sins to, to, to the end. And there's a redemptive, um, a fundamental redemptive character, a religion that, uh, that I, I, I view as, as being so valuable. And that's why it's, it, uh, it's, there's a war in Christianity right now, because, because of the redemptive nature of, of its uh, beliefs. The other yeah. ones, you know, the, the other, you know, not to knock the other uh, global religions, but uh, it, this is unique in this, in this, uh, in the Christian. And, and Christianity is very much uh, at war with itself and, and other forces battling against Christianity in the uh, Rosemary books, both Rosemary's baby and son of, of Rosemary. But, um, it's it's you have to read against the grain. You have to have an um, uh, a background. You have to have a cultural history. And he so he's really addressing two audiences. One one the audience is looking for plot. They're looking for excitement and and um, you know these are the Googlers of the day. Right? They're looking for something superficial. Right. But he's writing, and this is what I'm I'm looking at right. And you are too. He's looking for the intelligent reader, not the smart reader, the intelligent, the intelligent in terms of intelligence, people who are mm -hmm. clued in to what really is being said, the subtext of this information. And he's really, really good at it. And I'm sure it came right out of his military training as a propagandist, like Dr. Seuss, Theodore Giesel, who did all the great Dr. Seuss books to, to teach children a limited vocabulary, which also right. limits their intellectual ability. And right. I went to his house up, you know, down in La Jolla. He's, he's got a, it's all gated off now, but it's got a beautiful 360 degree view of the Pacific. Wow. Yeah. That's the rewards they will well, give Well, yeah. You. you know, you sell your soul to the devil. You're going to have a big house like that. Yes. Um, so, okay. So then his next one is 1976, The Boys from Brazil. Uh, basically, it's about, um, it's based on a not, Nazi hunter. Now, it, it's based on a Nazi, the Nazi hunter who is really Simon Weisenthal. Now, Simon Weisenthal, for those of you who have read my books, you know that he is connected to Robert Maxwell. And that, uh, in fact, Ghislaine Maxwell used to go uh, to Los Angeles, where the Weisenthal Center is. And that's a whole area where they're all connected there. And 
what appears to be a Nazi hunter is, is sometimes something else. But in Boys from Brazil, this is uh, Joseph Mengele. He's alive and well in South America, and he has plots to clone a new Hitler from the old. And um, it's it, the book was made into a film in um, 1978. Um, it was directed by Franklin, I think it's uh, Schaffner, who interestingly, he was born in Tokyo. Uh, he lived in Japan. Uh, he was born in 1920. He returned to the United States when he was five years old. He's the son of German reformed Christian missionaries. The missionaries it has a place here. Um, this connects to the son of Rosemary's baby. It connects to your puppets. I'm going to call them your puppets for the time being because I don't want okay. them. <laughs> the hand puppets, the sock puppets. <laughs> yeah. And so it's, uh, you know, and, and, all, and so I see it as, as another um, sort of MK Ultra esque film, um, Boys from Brazil, because there are all these children that are supposed to have been cloned. And if anyone remembers Jeffrey Epstein's desire to have a baby factory uh, in New Mexico, um, that's very similar. And then we have Sliver in 1991. And Sliver, when he wrote that, um, the premise was that there was a, a new building in, in, on the Upper East Side somewhere. And, and frankly, on the Upper East Side, there are no high rises. However, we do have some Sliver buildings now. How, but in 1991, when he wrote Sliver, which is about a very, uh, a building that is built on a very narrow plot of land, because the only way to then make the building would be to make it narrow and make it as tall as you can. So the building that this um, woman who's portrayed by Sharon, Sharon Stone, uh, who is um, connected to, I think, publishing. So she's a publisher. So she doesn't make that much money. And the building is for more affluent people. So again, we see the, the, the desire to uh, change your, your, your socioeconomic uh, situation. So she is able to get an apartment in this sliver building uh, because there've been some murders and people have died. And so they're empty apartments. And so she moves in and she's very happy and nobody really knows who owns uh, the building, um, and she ends up having a romance with the owner of the building, who is portrayed by uh, Billy Baldwin, who is Alec Baldwin's brother. And by the way, Alec Baldwin is one of my followers. All of these Hollywood people that are connected do follow my Twitter account. When I find them, sometimes I just block them because I think they just want to know what I know. <laughs> Um, and I'm not that keen in letting people know what I know. I, whoever is following me, I've, I've approved you at some point. Um, so she lives in the sliver building. And one day when she's with her new paramour, um, portrayed by Billy Baldwin in the film, uh, he takes her into his apartment, which is on the top level, where he opens the door. And just like a Jeffrey Epstein scene, he shows her a room full of monitors and the monitors show every room in the building, all the bedrooms, everybody's apartments. And she's fascinated, which I, I found a little bit disturbing that she should be fascinated. But of course, she, she soon figures out that this is not a cool dude. Um, it's passed off in uh, the circles of people who review books and who review films as a voyeuristic view and that he's sick. But no, this is what, ha what happens uh, with safe houses, right? That are connected to intelligence it, and it connects to promise, the promise software. So the promise software, just as with um, his book, um, A Perfect Day and with Sliver where all your movements are are, are seen, well, the promise software keeps track of people. And um, 
So it's not just that they kept track of all the sex slaves, which they did. So all of these different from my based on my research, and I think I've mentioned that I do speak and 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 know uh, the couple who created the original untampered with promise um, software. Uh, it was initially created to keep track of, uh, you know, sort of just internal documents for uh, legal cases or stuff like that. And then it was misappropriated by the State Department. The State Department then with Israel uh, went and uh, created uh, an area with the Cabazon Indians, which is what Danny Castellero was working on and what cost him his life, um, where they tweaked the, uh, the way that Promise Software worked. And it was had a the ability to spy whoever it was sold to. And Robert Maxwell was very much involved uh, before his untimely death on the Lady Galen. Uh, with the sale of Promise Software. Um, also, you know, a lot of Mossad agents were involved with the sale of Promise Software. Saudi people were involved with the sale of Promise Software. A lot of murders happened as a result of the sale of Promise Software. And I am of the opinion that it is the component of the MKUltra program, because if you remember Obama's White House, there was the Brain Initiative. So that it has continued to present day, uh, but it has, uh, it's not just like the Promise Software and MKUltra because there is a satanic aspect and that satanic aspect did not begin in 1945 uh, with the, uh, when the Nazi scientists came to the United States. And so um, that takes me to Son of Rosemary. And before I tell you my findings, which I think you're going to love, uh, what did you think of uh, that second book? Well, I thought the uh, the ending was cheesy. It, it turns out to be sort of like the Who Killed JR. It's, it's like a dream sequence. So it's kind of a cop out. But, um, you know, I have a feeling that this book wasn't really written by uh, Ira Levin. There, uh, Ira Levin, he, he, he made most of his career in uh, the theater, Broadway theater. He was a, a playwright, I think, uh, more so than, than a novelist. He's known for his novels. And, and I mentioned that because there's incredible dialogue in Rosemary's Baby, a lot of wit, a lot of banter. It, mm -hmm. it reads like those old screwball comedies in the 1930s. Uh, the types of films that Nora Ephron's uh, parents, who were screenwriters in uh, Beverly right. Hills, it had that witty repartee. But this book is utterly lacking, and it's it's mostly plot driven. And mm -hmm. um, I don't know if that was purposeful or not. Are they trying to cash in? So I'm looking at it from an aesthetic level, but also so far as um, clues that the psychopaths like to leave us because they feel mm -hmm. so superior to us. That this this book is chalk full of them and the mother son incest is the right the really the armature around which the whole plot is is wrapped and uh, that seems to be the ultimate um ritual transgression that the satanists the high satanists enjoy and of course it's a tease because at the end mm -hmm. she wakes up oh guy i was dreaming about all about being in, in the Dakota and being molested by the devil. So oh, Rosemary and um, they that get a call from like Hutch who, who had a coma and Hutch uh, snaps them back to reality and offers them say, Hey, listen, there's an opening at the Dakota. See, they weren't in the Dakota. They were at a place called the Branford, which is more like a rental place. Right. He named they aspired the to get into the Dakota. Yeah. So at the end of the book, he, they get the call. Now also there's one part, that's interesting. And this is to your point about him, um, Levin being interested in magic. Uh, he was interested in word magic, right? Kabbalah. Mm -hmm. And throughout the whole uh, sequel, Son of Rosemary, it's all about the game of Scrabble, which is anagrams. Yeah. And there's a big intellectual game there. And he never tells us what this anagram is i have oh, to look I, it up. i know what it is oh you do do you want to I tell us do. yes let me find the anagram 
you, 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 you're you always a step ahead of me. Okay, I have it for you because I knew you'd want it. Um. <laughs> <laughs> well, I knew you'd have it <laughs> because so. you, pick, you pick up on these little, people just kind of read past them, right? In general, <laughs> right? But I, I take my time and I take extensive, I index the whole book by myself. I just put it on these wow. post-it notes. Yeah, I don't have anyone help me because I don't want the waste wasted time so oh, i do yeah. all, all my research myself as well so i have the the anagram here i i don't know what you know i have like over a hundred pages of notes um for our conversation of today so hopefully i can find well i have it written here someplace but um i haven't oh, okay. organized my notes yet i still have them on the post-it notes I well, but you didn't them. figure out what the anagram meant. oh no 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 okay no. I, I, but i did I was going to cheat. I was going to look on a site, but I haven't gotten around. Oh, to no, it I don't. I don't think it's anywhere. Honestly. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. No, I don't think it's anywhere. Uh, oh, gosh. OK, just... what was the phrase first? It was like a burnt uh, goats or something. I can't remember what the, the, the phrase. It was, was. It, it, yeah, it was something. It's, let me just see if if I, if maybe I can just find it with the word with the word with that word. I, or maybe I put it in another. Oh, place. oh, the 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 phrase was roast mules. Right, right, right. Okay. So you're talking about burnt offerings there, right there. That's what I appreciate. But I don't know what what it spells. Is it like I'll you tell know, you. I'll I'll because I because you know I, Roman Castavets was uh you know Adrian Marcato. There's uh, Hutch clues them into an an anagram that exposes the the coven that they're living with on the same floor in the Bramford Hotel. Or Bramford Apartments, rather. And frankly, he named it the Bramford uh, after Bram Stok Stokler, or St what's the name? Bram, the Dracula guy. Stoker. Yeah. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I, I, I'm going to have that anagram for you in a second. It's in another file. <laughs> but the but the key he gave us was um, roast mules. Yeah, yeah. It's right and then there. there's the Magi. There's a lot of biblical, of course, uh, allusions, M-A-G-H. And I think that's a software, not a software program. Uh, what else? What are there? Soul Master. Soul Master, page 158. I have it, yeah, too. <laughs> Soul Master. And guess what? The people that he name checks, these are people that we've all read about in the different websites. On 158, there's Bing Crosby. Uh, Barbara Streisand's name shows up. Um and she was linked to that being um, filmed in a porno movie, right? Babs. Yeah. And uh, as you pointed out, linked to Bill Clinton and Hillary Clinton and her, her coven. Um, some other, these are people that he probably met in his on Park Avenue in his, his apartment up there. So, uh, oh, oh, he mentions uh, Mrs. Lush Rambeau, page 56. I think that's a, a play on uh, Rush Limbaugh. Oh, that's interesting. So, and, and Rush Limbaugh was just beginning to break. He comes out of Sacramento, by the way, because this this book was before Rush Limbaugh became a national figure. That's true. That's a good point. Um, so maybe they were, you know, they already had Rush Limbaugh um, selected to, to as a hangout, just like they're promoting um, uh, what's his name, Joe Rogan, right now. Yeah, yeah, they're do making a big deal with Joe Rogan. So yeah, yeah something's yeah. going He's on. He's a friend of um of Anton LaVey's uh, son or grandson. Oh, I did I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so um in the book though, uh she falls into a coma while she's watching Kukla Friend and Ollie, which is an early American television show um of Puppet what? Show. Yes, a puppet show, correct. Uh that was broadcast in Chicago between 1947, right, to 1957. Um, well, uh, the origin of the witch, Beulah, there's a real Beulah witch. And she, <laughs> and this is connected to, before I start, I want to just make the connection that it is connected to the founders of the United States. It's connected to the daughters of the um, American Revolution. Uh, it is all, we come full circle to the intelligence connection. So in 
Illinois, there was uh, an old lady that lived in a in a very in an old cottage uh, that was dilapidated. And it was she who led me, you know, not she specifically because she's dead, but it was finding this old lady that people refer to as a witch and she didn't have electricity in her home and she just had candles burning. Uh, and it, it didn't matter what happened and what she did, what horrible deeds she did, she was protected by the police. Uh, and and, and um, then I discovered that she had been a, a, a descendant of um, one of the founding fathers. So a uh, descendant, let me just, but it leads me to something else, uh, a, a, a a whole, a whole uh, communal uh, false prophet uh, thing that had the, um, the, the, the male head, and I'll get into it uh, as far as, you know, I don't want to take up too much time, but I'll get into that, where there, again, it was about teenage girls. Uh, well, that's the theme selected. of Son of, Son of Son of Rosemary. That's the theme. There's yes, this false and, and, prophet. It, it, it's all about it's that book is a ripoff of this uh, of oh, no. this whole thing, and so that book is actually very important. I didn't think it was until I met until I met um, the witch, and then I found out who she was and how it. So I'm going to go into this whole thing. So so. Um, She's a descendant of uh, Samuel Adams. Wow. And uh, so that took me to see why you cannot Google things because it won't take you anywhere. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so in, also this connects to uh, why the models of Victoria's Secret, uh, which was owned by Leslie Wexner, which who funded Jeffrey Epstein, wore wings uh, because the red-haired children of these young girls in this cult, that's a real cult that happened in Illinois, which there's information that you can probably find and they're trying to alter their history uh, but um, uh, they they had red hair, uh, so the the uh, girls. Now, Kirby, that he I found, didn't mention it last time, but have you done any research on Rh negative blood types? All I know is that it has to do with uh, aliens coming in and having sex with uh, my 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 uh, the people who I'm from. Mm -hmm. So okay. my mother, my 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 mother is from the same place that um, uh, Bonaparte is from, and I always forget where it's where that is, and that's a place. Um, uh, Corsica. Yes. So that I'm I'm so my my people are from Corsica, mm -hmm. and uh, in it is in Corsica that um, uh, thirty percent of the population have Rh negative blood. Which and I they have. have red hair too. They have red hair. Right now, I I I, I don't have red hair, but I have uh, tiny little freckles you can barely see, and that's a, you know none of my other family members have freckles, so mm. that's so I, I must be uh, an alien. Do you? What am I? Well, there there's that uh, strain, and of course, if you believe that uh, Egyptian or Sumerian royalty descend from aliens, then it fits, but. Uh, on a secular level, that means you're of a royal bloodline. Oh, okay. Yeah, you I you are you're that. not a slave. Really? Yeah, you're you're probably come from the dis uh, the. They're called royal bastards. It's a it's a technical term. They're called royal bastards. You know you know they, they're mm -hmm. profligate, uh, mm -hmm. uh, sexually right. Like uh, King Edward the Seventh, he's the grandfather of uh, Ronan and Pharaoh. Right. So if he ever get, becomes president, we'll have another British bloodline on the American throne, which has been almost the case every single time. But you are of a royal blood. If you are RH negative, you are of a royal bloodline. And sometimes, you know, they have these these family squabbles of legitimacy and they're always they, they create 
world wars, civil wars over the bloodlines. Just look at the wow. British history, for example. So you are not, that's why you have a divided consciousness. You are on the outside, but you're also on the inside. That's interesting. Um, thank you for that. Um, I know that I'm unusual because I was always different. And, you know, no one who's been through what I've been through and people trying to kill me left and right, uh, keep going the way I do. Um, well, they but, can um, never, they can never destroy you. Really? Yeah. Yeah. You're what, RH, what? you're RH negative. That's, just, that that is a thing you know during, that is during, a thing during the time that ira was uh inserted himself into my life he, he did want to know my it's the only reason that i even remember it and i did not even think it was important to put into the billionaire's woman but uh, but when I, I i've already put out the second um the second um edition and but when i do a third edition i will in, I'll, i'm going to include his interest in aliens, because we talked about aliens, his interest in um, time travel, his interest in my being RH negative, because Jeffrey Epstein had the same interest. And I didn't know, I wouldn't know, you know, from 30 years ago, you know, what I know today. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I didn't think when I started writing this book in the mid 1990s, because uh, I, I was able to leave him in 1993. And I wrote the book in 19, my very first draft of the book in 1995, once I had gotten married and settled down. And my husband, I, I told him everything I had been through. And he said, what is it that you want to do? And I said, I want to be a writer. So he said, why don't you sit down and write? And he was a writer. And I, I did the first version of uh, The Billionaire's Woman. Uh, however, I did it as a, as a, you know, as, as a work of nonfiction, uh, you know, I didn't. I didn't know to write it as a as, as a memoir. It, it took a couple of years to write it as a memoir as I as I became more aware of what had happened to me because it takes time um, for what you thought was real to see it as oh it was not real. But so I do remember his excitement over my being RH negative. I don't remember what he said to me. I do remember that he was very happy about it. Now, I don't know, thinking back, if I was selected by him, right? Because what I've learned from these, from studying the uh, trafficking rings that I seem to think that they're all connected to the same area, that the, uh, let's say like Johnny Gosh, for example, he was pre-selected and then somebody went out, took pictures of him without him knowing, and then they went back and he was abducted. So a lot of, and I know that before Prince Andrew uh, was introduced to um, Virginia Giuffre, that um, Glenn Maxwell and Jeffrey Epstein sent him photographs of Virginia and other girls, and he selected Virginia. And so I, I don't know if many years ago, the same thing happened to me. Um, I had won a beauty contest. Do you know that the beauty contest I won for every year, and I'm not going to mention the name because I have too many stalkers. Um, all of the contestants ended up be, being uh, historically uh, put into the Smithsonian Museum. My year is completely missing. Hmm. I was part of, um, I was mentioned in mainstream media from the time I was 17. All of those articles are gone. I was on television. You know, everything is gone. It's almost like I didn't exist. So at some point, I made the concerted effort when the internet came along to put up as much as I could. You know, I would write articles for whatever, the, you know, just, just to put something online because I was afraid that if I disappeared, because whenever I, when I began to put information online, like when I opened up, I think link, LinkedIn might've been the first place that was immediately taken over by Kirby's trucking company. And it was a time when you can still get customer service for LinkedIn many years ago when it began. And when I contacted them and said, hey, my page, this is my, my, my information. Why is it Kirby trucking? I was told that literally from my account, my email account that was connected to the LinkedIn page, like everybody's is, 
uh, had been accessed and had been changed and that they could not give me back my original page. So I had to create a second one. But that happened with everything I had. So I used to have a Wikipedia page that's gone. Um, so I, I'm thinking I'm, I'm the next thing that's going to go is me. I just try to put as much as I could online. That's why there's information about me. However, at this point, as you figured out the last time that we had <laughs> our interview, you found things online and you thought they were mine. No, these are fake websites that oh, yeah. um, the, the people who don't want me to be uh, taken seriously because I, I seem to be the only one talking about this stuff in addition to you. Um, but the only one that was actually connected to these people that's talking about it in a realistic way. I don't have anything to hide. I am not in a lawsuit. I'm not going to get any money from anybody. Uh, I'm uh, selling my books underground. So I, I'm not going to become rich by selling these books underground. Um, I have nothing to gain here, right? I, I work seven days a week. I've done this for years now. I get up at one in the morning. As you know, I sent you an email. <laughs> Good morning. This is... This is my morning. I know you're going to sleep, but um, I feel so lazy compared to you. <laughs> well, but you know, I'm a, I'm a woman on a mission, but I'm so happy you just told me they can't kill me, so I don't have to worry about that anymore. Well, my gosh, I thought you already knew about it. I'm glad we're having this conversation. I am too, because I I thought I was oh, still vulnerable. Okay. Well, oh, yeah. Well, hey, there's lots of literature, medical literature, not just the woo woo stuff, but um, it's it's biblical, too. It's in the Tanakh, you know, the what we call the Old Testament and um, and as, as well as in the New Testament, you know, the you know, this is where the alien deal comes. I think the alien uh, is thrown in there to throw people off the trail, like, you know, calling someone a conspiracy theorist, right? It's the the watchers, the Anunnaki. It's the the gods that that mated with with Earth women because they're so beautiful. Interesting. Yes. Well, so I wish I'd met you thirty years scripture. ago, and I wouldn't be um, terrified whenever I walk down the streets of New York and somebody shoots at me. <laughs> well, <laughs> but, hey. You know, I seem um, to dodge bullets, so that's okay. <laughs> well, there's a reason why you're able to dodge it. Yeah, I guess you, so. You have and divine there's a reason. protection. And there's a reason why there's so many, um, so much, uh, so many fake websites with false information trying to make it seem like, uh, how could I not know what I'm, nobody else is saying what I'm saying. Um, so in any event, let's get back to Illinois and this uh, tribe. Ock puppets. Yeah, well, there was a real witch and she led me to, um, a woman uh, whose last name was Beekman. So she was married to a guy named Beekman. And along comes um, a guy from Ohio. Ohio plays prominently in, in, in as it pertains to Wexner. And as you know, Facebook has moved to Ohio. Uh, all of the agencies are in Ohio. So it's become almost a, the central intelligence hub of to United States. And so this uh, German guy by the name of, I, I don't know if I can pronounce it, but I'm going to try Schweinfurch, and I'm going to spell that for everyone. So it's S-C-H-W-E-I-N-F-U-R-T-H. So he, he meanders into town uh, where she's living with her husband, and he kind of... Uh, lures her away from her husband and he becomes the second Christ. Uh, she has um, pretty much uh, already created a following of people around her. She's a cultist, uh, her and her husband. However, when George Jacob Swinefirth enters what is called heaven, um, they called it heaven and it was back in 18, the late 1800s. And so it was in 1882. And it's in, um, it, they're called Beekmanites. So when she died, uh, she was supposed to arise from the dead in three days. However, um, she was only human, right? And so he explained to her followers that her spirit had passed into his body 
and that he was the new messiah and as the new messiah um he had many um he had like it began with the colony who had about 25 people a lot of them were workers there was a communal arrangement uh, so it's very much like the it, it, ira levin's books and so the community of workers survived on dry bread and mush uh the favored members of the group with the beautiful young girls ate the best foods um the young girls who were beautiful, who he would have sex with and impregnate to have his children, some of them died, but they would be known as the angels. And so when I when I when I found this information, I was stunned because I found it in old newspaper articles from the turn of the century. So again, you have to go to to, to the source. You have to read because I didn't believe some of the comments that I read in different places. So I, 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 I dug up old newspaper articles because there are archives. Newspapers have been around for a very long time and you will read archives. Uh, so I was able to backtrack because he was found to have been fraudulent. He was sued. You know, there were lawsuits going back. You know, we're not the only people that have sued each other. He was found to be a false prophet. However, he had, um, he dressed beautifully. He wore the most expensive garments. He had the most spirited horses. Um, it reminded me so much of this perfect day for Ira Levin. And then when I saw the, um, the information for Rosemary's baby um, and the witch, and the witch is part of this, she is a descendant of these people. Um, so, he created um, historical characters. He had twice a week, the angels would put on flesh colored tights and they would dance. Um, the members of the colony were, you know, when they had his children, they, were, they all had red hair. And so immediately I went to the baby, uh, Rosemary's baby who has red hair. Um, that you know it's like it, all of it reminded me especially the the fact that there was a real um witch and so i had to keep going and so um in 1882 he is uh, accused of taking money from the converts um he had to uh surrender most of what he had accumulated he was found guilty um people who uh didn't believe in him uh, were so that there was heaven and there was like a hell. So that they were like, they were just like split the people who believed and the people who didn't believe. Um, let me, I just, there's so many, so many notes here. Um, I mean, it was a cult and the Chicago Daily Tribune uh, on May 29th, 1892, described the return of Signworth from his missionary trips and the way they wrote about it in 1892, the woods were scoured and stripped of every blossom. Floris and Rockford were called on for elaborate displays one hour before he was expected the prettiest damsels. Now these are young girls decked in gala attire, carpeted the road for a mile with flowers, the heavenly host met him two miles from the house, unhitched the horses from the carriage that bore his sacred person, and attaching a rope covered with evergreen, hauled him to the abode that was lonely when he was away. Uh, Mr. Weldon had been made a deacon of the assembly of Beekmanites. Upon the approach of the carriage, he was found waiting on the front steps. Uh, and then quoting further from the um, article, uh, the deacon advanced with stately step and placed a gilt paper crown over his pompadour. So on top of it, he had a pompadour. Um, so in any event, in the, in the 1890s, legal action was taken against him. He was accused of taking money and property from the converts because once you became a member of the cult, as we have seen with Jonestown and all the other cults, you surrender your worldly goods to him. 
Uh, he was found guilty and he had to return the real estate he acquired. He disbanded the flock, moved into Rockford, where he began a, a, a whole new life in real estate, and then he moved to Chicago. However, um, the cult continues to present day, and that mm. woman who is known in the local community as Witch Beulah, um, oh, gosh. lived in a very, in an old house in a cabin not far from where the big estate was, where he was living. And she would be laughing and screaming uh, until even after her death. So they would hear, you know, they destroyed the house because it was haunted. But um, the, the kids in the neighborhood always said that there was a witch who lived there. Uh, it was at the end of a closed road it was torn down. It was called Hell House. And um, again, it was referred to as heaven by the locals because they thought that she was part of like this select group. Uh, it was on land owned by the Weldon family that housed the cult, members of the cult that had fallen out of favor with the leader. But she was protected by the police, you know, so... Again, if, if you're connected, uh, so when this led me to the founding fathers and, and, and this, I'll just wrap it up here. When it led me to the founding fathers who are basically um, the American revolutionary leaders who united the 13 colon colonies that led the war of independence from Great Britain who built the frame of government for the United States of America um, and who did it in the 18th century. Uh, Abraham Lincoln was, was one of these people. He was one of the founding fathers. Um, he made his Gettysburg Address uh, in 18, 18, 1863. Uh, the phrase founding fathers was coined by Senator Warren, Warren, Warren Harding in 1916. Um, and so along with them was Alexander Hamilton, uh, Thomas Jefferson, George Washington. Uh, and then connected to them is a Daughters of the American Revolution. Now this terrified me because I live with the Daughters of the American Revolution, frankly. Uh, they have, uh, it's a lineage-based membership service for women who are directly descendant from a person involved in the United States effort toward independence. So they are connected to the um, founding fathers. Uh, so if you were raped by a slave owner and you, you're black, if you can show your lineage to one of these men, you, you, you are guaranteed entrance, but no one else is guaranteed entrance and there are chapters everywhere. I always knew that my neighborhood was very peculiar. Um, and right around the corner from where I live is one of their, they have their, their headquarters. Now this is New York? Oh yeah. Okay, what neighborhood is that? Upper ask. West Side. Upper West Side, money. Yeah, but they have their offices throughout the United States. So they have different mm -hmm. chapters everywhere throughout the United States. And there just the happens to be yeah. a large concentration in New York. You know who else is a daughter of the American Revolution? Uh, well, you won't me. guess. Bo Derek. <laughs> uh, doesn't surprise me. But she lived to tell about it. She's still alive and kicking, isn't she? Well, has she, she's never said that she's a member, has she? Oh, no, 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 no. This is news to me. I know, you know, Tan and uh, jo John Derrick, the actor who became her Svengali. Well, she, I mean, I, I can't, you know, this, we can go on and on like for days, I'm sure, but <laughs> I'll leave the audience with, with a, with a, this connects again, back to Jeffrey Epstein and back to his, uh, early days as a spy and back to the people that he was working for as far as uh, collecting money and his um, uh, days after he stopped working. Uh, in 1981, he stopped working uh, with um, the investment firm um, that again, it was Ace Greenberg and Ace 
was a magician. And I don't know if people know or realize, but in his obituary, it was said that he was a magician and he left a million dollars when he died, I think 20, 25 years ago to a local hospital so that they could buy Viagra for men who could not afford Viagra. It just goes to show you that these men that are connected in this world, uh, just, you know, they, they see us, the women, as we're just, um, we're, 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 we're objects in the, in the way that Levin very well described it in his book, Stepford Wives. And with that, that's all the information I'm gonna share with you today, Daryl. Okay. Well, can I add something about puppetry yeah. and, and magic? Yes. And children's shows? Mm -hmm. This is for the boomers out there now. You know, we talked about Kukla Fran and Ollie in the golden age of television when uh, it, before it moved to LA, it was in New York and then Chicago was a big television center. But there's another show, Boomers, my fellow boomers, that you might remember. It's called the Sherry Lewis Show. And her puppet was named Lamb Chop. Lamb as in the Lamb of God, chopped as in eaten and sacrificed. Now, Sherry Lewis, that wasn't her name. She was, she was a, trained as a ventriloquist. But the connection there is that her father was a professional magician. And he set up a whole network of magicians, clubs, showcases, uh, training grounds, schools to initiate people who would eventually become David Copperfield, perhaps, or Uri Geller. Right. Because, and if, if you want to see the uh, cinema version of it, see the reveal, the movie. Mm -hmm. Now, get this. Uh, Sherry Lewis is, I just found this out a couple of days ago when I was doing the Kukla, and, uh, Kukla Fran and Ollie research. Um, her father was also one, of, uh, apparently, I have to double check this, but from what I read, her father, in addition to being a professional magician, a magi, right, magic mm -hmm. with a K in it, was one of the uh, co-founders of Yeshiva University in New York City. Wow. Yes. So yes, it's magic. It's enchantment. It's uh, Bruno Bettelheim wrote a book called The Use, uh, Uses of Enchantment, which is about fairy tales, which are not about fairies. And they're not about, about uh, you know, their, their tales, their stories about torture and um, goblins and cannibalism, you know, Little Red, all the original stories collected by right. the Grimm brothers in, in Göttingen were really super gory stuff. So Ira Levin is very much within that tradition, the way I read it. Oh, a hundred percent. As are, I think once we start um, exposing and analyzing uh, a few of these people, it does become easier to spot someone else, right? So we know they 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 have a tendency to be magicians, right? Mm -hmm. We know that they've anyone who has achieved any measure of success has sacrificed, meaning that they have offered their 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 children into this um it's like a cult right it's like the uni cult at the end of the, the his book um uh this perfect day it's uh, you, you sacrifice your child um you commit murder um and you are rewarded and which is and if oh i don't want to leave you without telling you about chateau montmart Mont oh what yes please yeah because um let me just open that file. While you're looking at the file, can I mention one yes. Midwestern connection and, and magic? He entranced an entire nation late night when we're in that sort of twilight zone, <laughs> that, that, that nominal phase between waking and sleeping. And he was a magician when he was a youth, a teenager, and he went by the stage name of the Great Carsoni. Oh, yeah, that's right. You know who I'm speaking of? Johnny Carson. Exactly. He was a magician. You're right. I forgot got, all about that. Do you think he that. got that show, The Tonight Show? That is a plum, even back then. Do you think he got that randomly and by accident? No, you're right. No. You, you know what else? He had his wife. He was married three times, and each time the, the woman had the same name, the first same first name. Joanne. Yeah. He married three Joannes. Mm-hmm. And he lived, he had a residence in Rockefeller Plaza. 
Oh, I didn't know that. When um, he was in New York, then of course they moved to show the show to LA. And I'm such a TV junkie. By the way, for for people who don't know this, I, I am um, recognized as one of the top authorities on American popular culture and television history. I've written extensively, and you know, that's why what sounds to you like trivia, it's not trivia; it's scholarship. Right? That's this, right. Yeah, I have I have the credibility in the academic world. And these are the same people that were trying to recruit me, including the Annenberg School of uh, Communications, in order to queer out the uh, Asian American population. I didn't take the job, but George Takei did take the offer. And we all know what happened there, that, that PR right. campaign that he, he did. But right. uh, Johnny Carson, um, I was, and I'm telling you this because I wrote to Johnny Carson uh, when he was about to go off the air and I wrote him a, a long letter about what he means in terms of the American culture. Mm -hmm. And I asked for a ticket to his last week of shows. And guess mm -hmm. what? I was sent a pair of tickets. Oh, wow. So I was there the last week and uh, Farrah Fawcett was one of the guests. I wasn't there on the last show. The mm -hmm. very last show was, was strictly family members, uh, corporate executives from NBC, wow. high VIPs. But I got in the last week. Oh, that's great. Incredible. I took my friend. His name's Carl Boggs. I have a witness. Yeah. He was there. That's I wonderful that tickets. you did that. Well, yes, yeah, you know, Johnny we have Carson. to think about him. And now, of course, you bring to mind Ed Sullivan, um, who must have been part of the in crowd, right? And yes. uh, the other one, uh, the the forever young um, uh, the, uh, teenager what dick clark uh, dick i think clark. that we can put all these guys in the same box and la later i hope you'll go in on uh, vidal sassoon the man who who invented uh hair care boutique salon hair care for middle america well i can do that right now before we close um he was financed by the rickless family uh because i was part of the whole thing <laughs> Oh, no. and, but this time they used uh so michelle and rickless had three uh, from his first marriage he had three children and then when he married pia zadora he had two more um the first three children were marcia was the first born she was born overseas uh in palestine before it was uh before it was israel uh then in once he arrived uh in ohio then he had um mona Ackerman, uh, who married Ackerman, um, who was connected to the Franklin child abuse case, who was the, uh, who chaired the committee, uh, who reprimanded the SEC because they did not uh, catch Bernie Kornfeld. I'm sorry, not Bernie Kornfeld, Bernie Madoff. And that was the biggest, I, I watched it just with my jaw dropped, uh, thinking, oh, what a, what a, he's acting because he was, you know, he was part of it. But Bernie, Madoff was part of it, but um, so that they use Marsha Rickless, who married then Al Hirschfeld, who then became a partner of Stephen Hoffenberg, who was a partner of Jeffrey Epstein. These all, all these people just are just despite the fact that we go through the generations, right? They still they're interconnected with the same people. So they used Marsha Rickless as the uh, uh, as the uh, person through which they would fund Fidel Sassoon. And mm -hmm. uh, they did the same thing in, with the Epstein situation. And again, for some reason, I'm blanking out on the, the they, they did the same thing with Jay Sebring. I forget who funded Jay Sebring, but each one of these, um, every uh, generation needs who's connected to Hollywood. They need a place to send, because they're young girls, right? They need a place to send the young girls. Uh, there's also a reason that the hair is important. It's important for, I'm going to call it magic, so that uh, if a certain height hairstyle is used and this person is with another individual, but that hairstyle is used by another person, maybe it's a photographer, it's somebody doing a nefarious uh, activity for these people, um, they'll remember the hairstyle but they may not remember. So it's like the Stepford Wives uh, syndrome. They will not remember the specific person. It's, it's a magician's trick. So they use the uh, somebody like him uh, to, 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 you know, uh, create a certain hairstyle, maybe to replicate it on other people who are going to then fool 
uh, the, the mark into not remembering, well, can you pick out the person from this lineup or can you tell us what the person looked like? And of course, it would look like someone else. And so they use these people uh, for their for for their continued trafficking, which brings in a lot of money. Um, mm -hmm. And of course, you know, you have the blackmail. So and for he, Roman Polanski brought in his friend Vidal Sassoon onto the set to uh, shear uh, Mia Farrell's ritualistically her long blonde hair, which she was famous for in that series, that weekly series, the Peyton Place TV show, right. where she played the virginal, very introspective. She wanted to be a writer when she grew up. Uh, Allison McKenzie. Yeah, yeah. And the public, you know, I was around at the time and, I re and it, was, it was big news that, oh no, Mia Farrell cut her hair. Yeah, and when she made Rosemary's Baby, I don't know if I said this earlier, but she was married to Frank Sinatra, who, you know, was friendly with uh, John F. Kennedy. Um, and um, he did not want her to make the film. Uh, they had only been married for a very short time. So she really wanted to make this film. And um, he divorced her because of it. Um, she then became involved with Woody Allen. And I'm working on a lead that someone connected to Ira Levin in a familial, like he's a family member, uh, introduced a uh, Pharaoh to Woody Allen because I, 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 you know, I'm working on it. So I'm, I'm just going to leave it there because then she becomes involved with Woody Allen. Um, they never get married. However, they do have uh, their partners and they have this brood of children. Um, when she discovers, I believe it was in 1991, something like that, um, that Woody Allen has been molesting her adopted daughter, Dylan, who was seven at the time. They have, uh, you know, they have this bitter breakup. And then she's represented by Alan Dershowitz. I don't think anybody knows this because it's been scrubbed. Um, Woody Allen goes ahead and has a news conference at the Plaza Hotel. Who owns the Plaza Hotel at the time that he has his news conference? Donald Trump. So that, again, the, they, they have insiders like Jay Sebring or Vidal Sassoon, Alan Dershowitz, who I always said is a, a, a Mossad um, conciliary. And Sebring uh, was murdered at the uh, CLO. Right. Cielo House, Cielo yeah. Drive, along yeah. with Sharon Tate and Wojciech Fakowski, Albio Folger. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so, I, I mean, there's there are a lot of murders. Um, so, like at the Chateau Marmont, which became the temporary home of uh, Sharon Tate and Roman Polanski before they moved into uh, Cielo Drive, uh, was this castle like hotel very popular in Los Angeles. Um, it, later on in um, 19, I believe it was 1992, it is purchased by um, Andre Balaz. So I'm gonna spell his last name, B as in boy, A-L-A-Z-S. He is a friend of Jeffrey Epstein. He is in his black book. Um, he um, is connected to some of Epstein's top-notch, very wealthy recruiters like Rachel Chandler, who I discussed um, in the last show. However, weird things have happened uh, in the Hotel Chateau Marmont. And I will just talk about one of them. John Belushi died of an overdose uh, on March 5th, 1982. However, in one of the bungalows, it was said that he, he died of, a, of an overdose. Who was with him in, in the room when he died? There were two people with him. One was Johnny Depp. The other one was Robin Williams. Right after the death of John Belushi, Robin Williams' career took off with Mark and Mindy and all of that. Um, 
So things have happened in that hotel, which I believe are more uh, sacrificial murders. As, as you can see, it's like they become, allegedly, <laughs> they become, they kill each other, right? They sacrifice each other mm -hmm. um, so that they then can get what they have. So it's all of it. The satanic layer is there. Do you agree this we can't deny the satanic layer? I mean, people want to deny that it's part of this thing, but it's there. I absolutely agree. Okay. Well, I it's always uh, an <laughs> honor for me to speak with you. And I thank you for this. And again, I will urge everyone, if you're not following <laughs> Professor Hamamoto, go to YouTube right now, pull him up, subscribe to his incredible channels. I think you have, how many do you have? Three or? Well, I have two main ones. One's, one is uh, the primary one is Professor Hamamoto, which was just restored by TubeU. And I have a backup channel that's called uh, Daryl Y. Hamamoto, PhD. Uh, I would like to get that one up to a thousand subscriptions. That's the one I go to when I'm kicked off of uh, TubeU. Right. And um, I became a member of your Patreon, and I suggest uh, that you guys do the same thing. It doesn't cost a lot of money. And the information that um, Daryl Hamamoto uploads continuously uh, is very informative because it, 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 it helps you, it gives you a starting place to do your own research, real research. Um, and he's, he's by far, you've never heard me go on like this about anyone else. Uh, and I have been on other people's podcasts many times, and I don't know that I, they, they've all been very kind and they're all very nice people, but I've never been as excited to have connected with um, Professor Hamamoto. Uh, uh, you know, we're like-minded. So if you're following me, you have to follow him. <laughs> um, well, I want to thank, thank so everyone much. and thank you again. Um, well, people think, like the video, please. Um, it's going to air on his channel. It'll air on my channel. We've come together to help put this information out to our combined audiences because his audience and my audience seem to think alike. So this is a way for us to spread information as broadly as we can. And I hope that we've done that today. And I can't thank you enough, Kirby, for inviting me on this morning. <laughs> As usual, it's a scintillating discussion. Uh, as you're talking, it just triggers all kinds of new information and connections with me. And I just have one request. Um, I hope that you will work up a talk on your findings about the whole uh, RH negative phenomenon and your position within it. As we know, it's really connected by bloodlines, all of the, these these um these networks of power well thank you for bringing it to my attention because uh until i met you i never saw it i never gave it a second thought i will now wonderful thanks thanks again <laughs> for the invitation to be with you here today yeah, and thank well, you thank ladies you for and gentlemen for listening <laughs> okie doke bye everybody have a good day like our videos bye